All right, let's kick it off. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining another RA Community Webcast. Today we have a replay from CA World 2016, and it's going to focus on automating application deployments, best practices, and getting started. Today we have Anand, who is a principal consultant for DevOps and Continuous Delivery presenting, and he's going to give you guys a great presentation today. If you have any questions as we're going through today's session, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and we'll get to them when we have a chance. We'll pause every once in a while for questions. If you have any questions that you think are better reserved to ask over the phone, you can hold them until the end of today's session, at which point we'll open up the phone line for any questions that you guys have. So those are your two options, and we'll get to them as often as we can throughout today's session. And with now, with no further ado, I'm going to hand the call over to Anand. Go ahead, Anand. Hey, thank you for the great introduction there. So this is Anand Jahan, and I'm uh, a DevOps consultant on the continuous delivery team. Uh, really, really excited to actually be here talking about this, really my favorite topic. You know, um, we, we, we did this session at CA World. We had about 50 to 60 attendees in the room, and it was pretty vibrant. Just, um, many of them like sharing ideas, and that's exactly what I like to do today as well. Kind of share my ideas uh, in terms of what I have learned over the years, just like you guys are basically joining this webinar right now, this webcast. Uh, similarly, I join a lot of meetups. I go to meetups, I join webinars. Get, get a lot of information around this topic, right? So my goal for you today is to kind of share some of those ideas and what I like to call them success patterns with you to see what will work within your organization and when it comes to really automating application deployments, right? Uh, how do you get started? What the best practices are? So that's what it's designed for, you know, tips, techniques, what to do, what not to do, right? So with further ado, let me just kind of go into the next slide here. And uh, there you go, the next slide. So uh, that's what I personally believe in. Uh, as I was mentioning, you know, we have, we all go to webinars, but at the end of the day, it's about, you know, there's one thing about vision and strategy. You know, many of the customers we work with, they have a very clear focus strategy of, you know, sometimes how do you, you want to kind of design their pipeline, right? How do you design their continuous delivery framework or like an automation framework? What this session will be focusing on is really the execution part of it. To me, I guess strategy without you know having a really laser focused execution is essentially hallucination, right? So we make sure that we um, kind of start focusing on the key elements that are needed to set those pillars in place, set those steps in place to kind of move in the right direction. Right? So that's what we'll be focusing on the execution part of it. So um, how do we get there, right? Uh, again, the disclaimer slide. So we'll kind of move on with this. And so what's the agenda? How do you get there, right? So essentially what we'll do is we'll quickly touch on what's this notion of the automated application deployment and how does it really relate to the bigger picture of an optimized software factory? You know, touch on the software factory concept a little bit. Uh, it's been there and that, that word and that term has been used in, in this space for some time now, but how does this automated application deployment really help you Kind of put it all together in, in a software factory you know, model. Uh, the next thing is, of course, you know, as soon as we skip that overview, we kind of go into the best practices. Um, like I said, you know, things we should be doing, um, and which I'll be kind of looking at the market and looking at a customer profile and see what's working for them. So that's what I'd like to share with you. That's the success patterns. And more importantly, the things you should not be doing, right? So that also helps you identify. You look at, we go back and look at the organization, even if you are you know, on, the, on your journey to continuous delivery, on your journey to automation, to identify the areas that you would need to probably focus on, right? So that kind of helps you. The anti-patterns really help you identify, are you doing that really? Is it something that maybe you should kind of look like, deeper into and see if you can really kind of overcome those anti-patterns? That can really help you with your processes as well. So once we have those best practices kind of um, discussed, we'll essentially give you like a five-step process, you know, like, what's the best way to get started? There's so many things that we could do, right, within an organization, looking at the strategy, and then what are those stuff, things I've been seeing at a customer, you know, uh, the successful customers we have, and what's working for them? And what, what are some of the books that we have in the market? What are they talking about? So what I, do, I did is I rationalized them into the, the five-step kind of a framework, or I would say an approach, um, and we could, let's look at that and see if that fits the peer model as well, right? And of course, we'll do a quick demo, uh, just to kind of touch on some of those elements. Firstly, I'm very a visual person, so I will really have slides to set the concepts, but once we get the demo, I'm going to touch on some of these key steps in, the, in place as well and kind of set the stage for you to understand how it really 
looks and feels within the experience automation solution as well. And of course, we'll do feedback, recap, and summary towards the end. Right. So, so with that, let's kind of go into the, uh, the, the content here. So the first thing is, um, when you look at this whole notion of software factory, right, we've we seen that a lot in terms of, you know, it's kind of model on the, the factory concept. But uh, when you start overlaying the manufacturing factory with the software lifecycle, we clearly see the software factory concept a lot more complex in nature, right? And we got, you know, many different product application teams, you know, basically interconnected, interdependent. So it's naturally while there's some of the key concepts that we can very well gain from the, the, the factory model or the factory concept, but there is when it comes to software factory, it's basically some of the key challenges that we see in, in our day-to-day -day routine. So when you look at the factory per se, one of the key disciplines, so that's what we have like one to seven here. Essentially the first thing is what do you have as requirements, right? That's what the business is investing in. That's where you can start tracking your requirements. The whole goal being that you can take your requirements from point one, which is that, that step number one, to your customer you know, in a very streamlined manner. That's, that's the goal. That's really where the value is the gain, right? You invest into development, that's requirements gathering. The next thing is number two here, which is release management, which is essentially that the whole, the release management team is ensuring that all of that development teams, all the applications that are getting built, are they, how, how are they exactly kind of modeled in ensuring that the dependencies are taken care of and how are that basically getting released into market on time? So it's all about precision there. It's about ensuring that your you know, investments are getting to the market on time. So number three to me here is essentially the whole notion of the application architecture and composition of the architecture, or the enterprise architect team. They ensure that all your compliance and you know, all the, the different rules and frameworks and the best practice architectures are set in place for all the applications within the organization, especially your mission critical applications within the organization. So you, Build the application, you have number three, which is the architecture of the application. And then you have four, five, and six, essentially, which is the four is you have development teams working on the requirements on a daily basis. And you have features, requests, changes, defects coming through, and they get built, right? So they, the development works on it, they get built as built packages. That's really where we see a lot of customers kind of having the continuous integration framework, built automation framework, moving to continuous integration. So they'll build those packages, and they'll want to put it on this pipeline, which is the notion of this thing in the center right there, which is the continuous delivery workflow, right? And we'll kind of touch on the term continuous delivery in just a minute, right? But the whole notion being that you kind of want to put it on the pipeline so that when it kind of gets built, it gets to the customer in the fastest possible manner and, and highest quality as well. Right? And as you, when you talk about quality, that's very, very, very much important. It's about not just continuously delivering, it's about continuously testing quality. Because the end goal is taking it from your requirements to the customer is to not just basically deliver the highest quality, which has been the notion, you know, the foundation of how we deliver software over the years. But now, especially with the market pressures, uh, with competition, competitive pressures, you also want to deliver it at a high speed and with a high degree of precision. So really that's where that comes in. Our focus for today will be six primarily, which is the step number six here, which is deployment automation. How can we bring this all together in a more adaptive, dynamic nature where you can create that workflow, which I like to simply call the flow in the center, which is adaptive. Um, you know, it really takes into DevOps and lean principles into account. And once you create that, establish that flow, which is being in control of that flow, the next thing you do is then you do the feedback loop, which is like the three ways and the three steps that we typically think of, right? Which is you create the flow, then you create the feedback loop, then eventually, once you have the feedback loop and the flow, then guess what? You can actually continue to deliver as you need. So that's really what we'll be touching on. One key aspect of this is how do you get to that point? So the next thing here is we'll look at is, actually, you know, we all want to go at high speed, but if you don't have the quality of the precision, that's what happens. You don't want that to happen, right? So how do you essentially get you know, deliver with speed, precision, and quality, right? And one of the key to patterns that's been kind of in the market right now is continuous delivery. So there's various definitions of continuous delivery which are in the market. You know, our mission and our, you know, really goal for our customers with continuous delivery is giving you the ability to really reliably deliver high-quality applications at any time on any environment. 
right? It doesn't mean you're delivering every minute or every other second and things like that. You know, we got customers who are doing 30,000 deployments a, a month, right? But to me, the whole notion of continuous delivery, it's driven by the business. It, it's driven by the fact that when do you, when does your business wants to deliver the software? You know, it could be if you have already have a quarterly cadence, maybe because of, you know, market and partner pressures and customer pressures, you actually want to deliver it on a monthly basis. How do you get to that point quickly? So that's the key notion of continuous delivery. Again, to, you know, you know just touch on that, is it's basically giving your organization the ability, right, to deliver high-quality applications at any time on any environment. So that's the goal, right? So, and how can you get that is by ensuring that you can expedite the delivery, right? ensuring that you can deliver faster. Um, you do that by reducing the release errors. Many times I've seen customers who have a whole lot of release errors. So what they're doing is not just releasing, trying to release faster, but they're spending more time fixing those release errors rather than essentially working on new features coming in. So how about we reduce the errors or even eliminate them? So you can start focusing on a value add onto your pipeline. The next thing is complexity. We talked a lot about complexity, uh, which we all see in, you know, on, on a daily you know, basis of that. You know, there's so much complexity within the, within the application you know, life cycle, especially. There's complexity within the environment. There's complexity within the application models. How do you harness that complexity, right? So we kind of introduced the notion of this model-based, uh, I would say, deployment, uh, which really take control of that complex deployment in a, in a very easy to use and reuse manner. So we touch on that concept here. Increased visibility, you know, when collaboration, to me, that kind of goes hand in hand, right? One of the key things which we see in the reports recently is a lot of talk about, you know, culture being one of the key barriers, right? After all, DevOps is all about your people, process, and technology in that order. I believe in that order, right? And it's all about people. So if, for example, everybody here on this, on this webinar, how do we all kind of come together on, on a common goal? It's by having those common sort of reporting, common stuff metrics which drives towards the business goal, right? So essentially it's about increased visibility and traceability of how you're progressing with on that pipeline. That really drives collaboration in our mind. And of course, you know, continuous delivery is an ongoing journey. We all understand that. You know, there is a place that you feel that if you're mature enough, you can always do better. You know, you can always do better the next day. How do you set that baseline and start improving? So these are the, the core pillars is about you know, uh, how do we go about really implementing continuous delivery in organizations? Many customers we have, we, you know, we'll be happy to kind of share with you either in a subsequent webinar or, you know, in terms of the, 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 the benefits they have gained from just adopting this whole notion of continuous delivery um, and within the organization. So, so that's essentially that. So uh, here's a question for you. You know, I think we could, you could just put it in the chat window, you know, and in terms of, where do you feel you are within the country still be journey, right? In terms of, and where do you want to take it within your organization and pretty much what your role is within the organization as well. We'd love to kind of hear from you in terms of uh, what do you feel are your challenges too, right? So if you get a chance, you know, just kind of throw in some of the, some of the points and thoughts you have about your view of continuous delivery for your organization and where you want to take it. What we have been seeing and we've been helping our customers is essentially like, you know, when we, when you work with the customers, they have been doing manual, uh, you know, deployments for a lot of time in the past, but now I'm seeing more kind of a pivot towards like scripting. You know, they have these scripts, they, they, they are kind of automated, but they're still triggered by a person. That's really where the, the thing from manual to scripting comes in. You know, manual is basically, they have a whole set of documents and they have to follow for compliance reasons, regulatory reasons that can kind of go through deployments. They've gone to kind of model that into a set of scripts and they start doing that. But eventually what we see is that the, the subject matter experts of that information, they get over pretty quickly, right? And especially imagine this, right? If you've got subject matter experts, the reason why they call experts, if you're calling them like late in the night with a very short maintenance window on a weekend, nobody would like that. Uh, plus they have, because they're experts, they also get called in to do many other things. So how do you keep up with those changes, right? It's quite overwhelming. At the same time, for regular reasons, you know, audit reasons, you have to track those changes that are coming along. So how do you do all that, right? So that's really where we start kind of helping our customers to really get on that journey where, you know, they can really come, move away from the slow manual application release processes. really hard to maintain those aeroplane scripts. We kind of move into this model-based, repeatable deployment process, which can really take control of your deployment. That's where the automation comes in. That's really where release automation as a solution shines because it's gonna help you 
not just get on that, essentially the DevOps kind of methodology and the mindset, but also helps the team come together in terms of how you're going to release that on that pipeline. Right? So that's the automated. Once you start automating your deployments, which is essentially this session, you start going to how do you start evolving into inclu being inclusive of kind of creating a continuous delivery of the service, right? That's the next phase. That's where many of our customers are going. Once you start, you know, essentially kind of just establishing that continuous delivery pipeline, they start quickly evolving into an optimized software factory where they can have not just their legacy applications, they may have a legacy application, they may have forward-looking applications, they may have container technology, um, you know, they may have new APIs, new channels of business they may want to open up, right, um, which um, Gartner calls like a bimodal approach, which essentially means that you may have your primary web channel, you may have a mobile, uh, a, a mobile, you know, channel for a new business model coming up, and of course the API that business as well. So really that's where our customers are going. Eventually that's the goal is that they can get to that optimized software factory where they can deliver any application at any time within the environment. So we realize that's a journey, and that's exactly where we're helping our customers. So we spoke about the tool, right? We talked a little bit about, you know, the people part of it, talked a little bit about the process. We'll go into a little bit more detail about what these steps look like in a, in a bit. But essentially, what, where do we help, right? With what, one of the core solutions we have within the continuous delivery portfolio is we have CAD automation, right? And that's essentially what I like to look at it is that the patterns and the, the anti-patterns that we're talking about, right? How does a customer use solutions like CLEs Automation to overcome some of those anti-patterns and start moving towards some of those industry and established practices, which we will be looking at folks and, you know, solutions and our customers. Like, what are those practices that work for them? So essentially, what does CLEs Automation have today, right? So in, in my mind, in a very simple way of kind of putting it, you got on the left, you have deployment automation, right? which is really where we have been in the market. We have been leader in the market for a lot of years, as well as we had a thought leadership. We were one of the ones who initially started, uh, you know, establishing this, this notion of release automation, um, which really helps our customers get an application-centric view. Uh, we provide a very modular, dynamic deployment framework. It essentially helps them reliably automate the application, right, on demand, so they can take an application, a very com complex composite application in a very complex composite environment, and they can start deploying the applications onto the pipeline. So that's where we have been helping our customers over the years. So essentially, that's the notion of a core deployment automation, right? And we'll see a demo as well for this, this area. Uh, one of the things we'd like to kind of cover in like future uh, webinars as well is this whole notion of like continuous delivery. How do you evolve from just deploying this one application, right? into being more realistic, right? And in, in, in the real world, in an enterprise you know, space, what we see is that many different applications get rolled out. They have dependency between them. Your release cycles are lined up based on a very fixed maintenance window on a very you know, similar set of environments. How do you ensure that your dependencies are taken care of as you, as you release them? So that's really where the continuous delivery addition, um, which is part of the release automation portfolio, really helps our customers you know, plan, manage, and optimize that continuous delivery path pipeline as well. And you see some screenshots of that as we go along. Right? So essentially, release automation, you know, really helps, is, is kind of a proven foundation for companies to execute that DevOps and continuous delivery strategy. Right? So how are we doing that today? So um, as I said, you know, there's a, a, I take this term very seriously, best practice, right? Um, what really makes it a best practice, right? In my mind, a better practice is something that I would say you kind of read and hear about in their blogs and books and things like that. To me, it, it, it becomes a best practice, and I, I use that word very carefully, like I said, when it's proven, it's proven to me, it's proven into my environment uh, within the organization that I work with, the customers I work with, or it's proven if they, I see a lot many you know, customers adopting that pattern. So that's what I'll be sharing with you. I've, I've seen these patterns being regularly used by our customers, and they definitely can quickly overcome and start on this journey from just not automation, but start towards quickly get onto the continuous delivery journey. So that's really what I'll be talking about next is 
what are the first things? It's like, okay, uh, things we should be doing before I look at things, what we should be doing, let's start things we should not be doing, things you should watch out for, right? Which is the anti-patterns especially, right? What are those barriers that really impacting, right? The whole notion of cost quality and precision, right? And of course, ultimately impacting the customer experience. What are those things we should watch out for? The first thing what I see is the manual handoff, right? Many times, okay, it's not just when you say manual handoff, it introduces errors. You know, many other times we see that it introduces errors uh, with the manual handoff and the manual process. How do you ensure that when you have those, you know, kind of manual handoff, one of the things is how do you keep track? You know, the thing that, for example, if you take a set of steps at, let's say, 9 a.m. in the morning, I might be, you know, might do it many times, but if you give me the same steps in a, in a very pressure time sensitive manner on, on a weekend at like, maybe like 3 or 5 a.m., it's like it's not be really the same, right? So how do we make sure that that's one of the things that see that 50% of the errors are really caused because of manual process, manual handoff. So that's the first thing you want to kind of start looking at is that how do you take control of it? The, the next thing is tribal knowledge. Um, you know, subject matter experts, um, I think they're better placed to kind of help really improve your processes. So to me, I think that's essential is to ensure that all of the tribal knowledge, right, is kind of captured into a very visual form, right, the model that we like to call it, where everybody within the team understands what the process is and how we can improve on it, right? The next thing here is the visibility silos, right? It's about, you know, everybody has their own dashboard, but that's good for their team. Where is the dashboard that's lining up what the business is investing in? That's the, the flow I had shown you like from one to seven earlier, which is you have the requirements. So where is that where you can look at that from requirements and where is that value within the, within the pipeline, right? If you can't have the common dashboard and goals, you could come back as a team and say, you know what, if this is the area I can improve on, it really drastically improve my, my framework as we go forward. So having those visibility silos, that's one of the key problems I've seen is everybody has their own metrics, but there's nothing which really lines them up into a common goal and vision. And lastly, I think release package integrity. Um, many times we talk about testing code. Right? I mean, we, we know that whole concept of testing code. We have QA teams and test teams test automation frameworks to do that, but we need to start testing our deployments too, right? It should be part of a deployment routine, right? When, you, when I talk about the model, this model for deployment is model for testing too, right? So how do you make sure that that's gonna ingrain and bake in within the deployment process? So, and so that's essentially what it is, is by ensuring the same release package is being deployed to the first environment. And when you start deploying to the next environment, you keep testing the same package, you have a high level of credibility into how you deploy the package. The anti-pattern here, what we have typically seen is, once you have the package, as it goes downstream, uh, you have tested it with, let's say, package A, or maybe a 1.1, and then it goes through the next phase, and then you start having a 1.2, and then you know that kind of sneaks into the next environment, and that causes issues. And then eventually, when it gets to production, it doesn't work. So, of course, because it's not being tested upstream, you know, and in terms of development and QA, it's not gone through those different cycles. So, that's the, that's the notion is about ensuring that once you build a package, you want to kind of get it through the, at least the very minimum phases uh, before you start getting into production. So that's, that's one of the key patterns. So, all right. So coming to the main thing here, right, which is, okay, what's, so that's the anti-pattern. That's what I think I should be watching for, like manual processes, travel knowledge, you know, so and so forth. Uh, there's a few silos and, you know, but what is the thing that really helped me accelerate my, notion of automated deployments. So what has helped me is essentially what I've seen is typically, you know, I was trying to get it through basically the top five or six things that, you know, we could do to really get started. So I was looking at different books, you know, over the years, and one of the key things where it all started was really the goal. The book, the goal was really, you know, the author kind of went in and look at who does manufacturing and look at, you know, where is the, where is the, it basically start to introduce the concept of theory of constraints, right? So like where do we start looking at those top, you know, areas where you can focus on to really gain that value, right? It essentially create that flow. We started touching on that. The Phoenix project, it took that manufacturing or the software factory concept and started adapt, adapting that into a very easy to read, um, you know, about, you know, how exactly that kind of pertains to a software factory, right? What are the pains and things like that? and how exactly he introduced the, the whole notion of three ways, which is what I was talking about earlier. It's like create that flow, right? Create a feedback loop, and then once you have both of them nailed down, then you can, of, of course, create that continuous delivery loop as well, right? So that's the whole notion of the three ways that are infused. 
lead principles is about, you know, again, create the flow, create the value stream end to end, which to me, the main thing about lean here, so the takeaway, which I see in many customers is that keep your initial deployments as lean as possible, but also be inclusive of your key, you know, uh, processes and key teams, which are, could be part of it. Like for example, the other day I was working with a customer, they said that we're talking about automated deployments, but it's very important. Automation is not just about, you know, orchestration is not just about automation, right? It's there's many different people involved, there's many different teams involved, like info security team, change management team. So make it inclusive of that process, that initial pilot that you may have when you start doing this, you know, kind of getting started with the automated deployment. So that's the whole notion of lean principle that I would basically include is like map your value stream of, you know, how you're taking it from the requirements and releasing it to production, map it out, right? And then you make sure that you are including all the different elements that are part of it. Even if it's a manual step, include it as a part of the orchestration step. Then the continuous delivery book came in, right? I mean, that was great because then you have the, the concept and then you have something which is a practitioner's view. So that was a continuous delivery. The great thing about the DevOps handbook we just recently came up was that it took the principles and you know practices which is in continuous delivery and it basically took the concept of Phoenix Project. The two authors actually got together and wrote the DevOps handbook. So it kind of takes a three ways notion that that concept and then applies it to the practitioner's view and then you have the DevOps handbook. So, so the point being that, you know, when you have these books, right, that kind of helps you with the patterns, right? And like I said, the success patterns is when you start looking at the customer profile and see what's working for them. So these are the top things I would just kind of list them out here. The, the mapping the value stream, we talked a little bit about that. Make sure that all the different teams are collaborating and coming together to kind of form that initial pilot or the initial getting started with your automated deployment framework. Be inclusive of that, not just the automation, be inclusive of all the teams that are involved. See the flow, uh, just that establish that pipeline initially, you know, and then evolve as you go. Don't just wait too much, don't do strategy, don't do strategies too much too long. Um, you know, set that flow. And then I'd like to introduce the notion of deployment pipeline as a concept, right? It's ensuring that everybody has the same visibility within exactly where the applications are within your, you know, pipeline at any given time, right? What's the build? What's the version? What's that artifact package you have, right? So that's the whole notion of the artifact package with the couple with the deployment pipeline. And then, of course, the automated deployment and the auto promote. Why is that important? Um, it's kind of, again, the, the whole notion of the ensuring that you can not only test your code, but you can test your deployment. So imagine if you could have a build package ready within something like a build automation engine or you know something, it could be you know, Jenkins. So for example, you have that ready, you automatically deploy it to your first environment. It could be a development, it could be testing. And then once you have deployed it, you automatically promote it to the next environment. So you not only tested your code, which is part of the testing cycle, but now you're testing your deployment as well. So imagine that you know, percolating into production, like that's just staging in production, you've already tested your deployment so many times, you will have a high quality release as, as you go downstream. So that's why it's a very important concept to grasp as well. And of course, uh, the model-based deployment, which is again, I'll kind of walk you through some of this visual. Why is that important? Is to really harness that complexity that we see within the, within the application space. Of course, there's a complexity at the moment, but environment complexity coupled with the application, it can get quite convoluted and complex. And that's exactly the reason why we're not gonna get away from scripting and manual processes into going into a more model-based approach where you can reuse not only across environments, but across applications. Right. So um, as we go, uh, you know, definitely feel free to like put, you know, your feedback in the chat as we go along and your thoughts as well. And if you have any thoughts and ideas that you feel that it could be something that we should be looking at in terms of the success patterns based on your experience, I'll be happy to hear them uh, and as, as feedback. Thank you. All right, so going to the next one. So um, so we talked a lot about these concepts. So we talked a lot about these patterns and anti-patterns of what we should be watching out for. So how do you get started, right? So here's the five-step process that I was basically talking about earlier, is that the first and foremost is to establish the pipeline. Right? You establish the pipeline, you know, everybody, all the different functions are, then you start creating those modular deployment process for your applications, you define the artifact package model, and, you know, establish the quality control gates, and then you baseline your metrics. Everything you do here, number five, is the whole notion is you continuously start tracking your metrics, you start tracking them, and then start using analytics, which is essentially 
on top of just basically metrics would be something like a throughput metric of you know how fast you're going from point A to B. But then analytics could be that you know maybe if I have many different applications, how can I improve on application A because maybe my app, so there's something in application B that I'm doing better. Right? So how do you do continuous improvement based on those analytic reports? So the next thing is okay, let me just start showing you what does that look like. Right. So the first step was establishing the pipeline. Right? So it's about creating that release blueprint. You will align your business requirements, you know, to basically your phases within the pipeline. Very important. Adaptive because you have the you know, employing DevOps and lean principles. How do you be adaptive to that pipeline? It should not just be, you know, you know, forcing you to basically create a pipeline and then just stick to it. You know, as you go through the process, you want to be evolving your, your pipeline as you go as well. And dynamic deployment. And you know, that's one of the key concepts where, based on the type of the artifact that comes in, you would want to deploy it to a particular environment based on that type of the artifact. Um, it could be an ex executable if it's a, in a SQL file. You want only that for the deployment. It really speeds up your deployment. And it also makes your you know, process very efficient here. And ensuring you have the right control gate. It's about quality control gate, it's about compliance control gate. How do you maintain, um, ensure that that is part of your process? And one of the key things over the pipeline is, you know, customers have invested in a lot of technologies over the years. So how you do make it like an open, integrated kind of a framework where it's kind of inclusive of not only your existing investments, but also future safety. Like if you plan to invest in, let's say, Docker or container technology tomorrow, how do you ensure that your pipeline is adaptive enough to not just be able to integrate with the existing technologies, but even your future forward-looking technologies too? Right. And of course, lastly, this is one thing, one of the patterns I was talking about, mapping your value stream. It's about in, ensuring that your standard protocols for governance, release quality, and security, change management are inclusive as a part of the process. So I know we're talking about automated deployments today, but what I'm suggesting is that not just look at it from an automation perspective, but looking at it from an orchestration perspective as well, and make sure that all your different teams are part of this deployment process. So that the first step was establishing the pipeline. Uh, the next thing is like the model-based like deployment process, right? So what are some of the elements that you know, if speaking from an architectural perspective, what are those design, design elements I should be watching out for when I start building these processes? So one of the things when I design the process, I always look for these atomic processes. You know, there's a very natural inclination that you know, let me just build this one big process. It's a workflow engine, right? And we can very much build a big one with one big one big workflow. But what I would suggest to do is that make sure they start designing in such a way that each of those atomic, you know, processes, processes or these smaller bite-sized processes are reusable and repeatable. So if you have something which is like a, you know, a step to it's essentially like, you know, let's say run a SQL script, right? It could be an executable SQL script or it could be something of just a read-only SQL. How do you make sure that you, you know, make it usable not just for that one application type but across application types too? Similarly, if you have a J2E application, how about you, if it's on based on JBoss, and you may have a, a, a model to kind of ensuring that you can deploy that JAR and the WAR file onto the JBoss application server, so that's essentially like your model, right? So what you'll do is you, you'll build it once. It can be used not just for that one JBoss application, but any JBoss application across the enterprise. So the benefit is that you can quickly onboard new applications as they come. You can share and reuse them across applications. So that's the whole idea of shareable. You also want to make sure that it's environment agnostic. So the, the benefit there is, is you know, is, is, is a lot because when you look at that, you start building your flows, you're not only like deploying to one environment. If you have multiple different servers in your environment, you can de you know, deploy to one server, you can add new servers quickly, and then essentially the same process will run across the environment. And that's the benefit that CV's automation offers you in building that kind of a model-based approach to these properties. And then, the, the latter part is the next point is like building in, like taking in that deployment validation. So ensuring that you have your, you know, test automation frameworks in place, you have your test data being generated, all of that can be done automatically. So you auto validate the deployment. So your deployment is not complete until you validate the deployment, right? So essentially that's really where your test hardness would come in. If you have Selenium, it would be very well that, you know, if you have something like a blaze meter, or a performance testing J meter, you know, as downstream for performance testing, you could very well have that as your maybe a, a staging or you know, something in the testing cycle as well. And the, the other thing is you auto promote. So once you have done your deployment validation, you auto promote as well. 
to the next environment, especially within the case testing arena, where you can auto promote and test in the farm as well. So that's the next one. So the the artifact package model. Uh, this is how it looks. Essentially, you're tracking all the way. The screenshots here are basically essentially telling you that you're tracking all the way from the, the top, which is your tracking your business requirements, to tracking you know who, what, where, and how, which is the department bill getting generated. And eventually the artifact package. So you have the end-to-end -end package tracking from, once you kind of create that artifact package for a deployment, you're, it's inclusive of all the changes, like from binaries to changes to app configurations, and you're ensuring app package integrity because you're just ensuring that your deploy the first environment, use the same exact package to deploy to the next environment. So customers ask me like, you know, that, that's great, that's an ideal world, but in my world, we would have some changes as we go along. So that's, that's fine, you know, if you have those changes, you can read on the deployment, get a new package, and then push it across. So it's essentially the whole notion of roll forward or roll back. It's a roll back. I personally prefer roll forward is whenever possible. So that really helps you, you know, kind of employ some of those disciplines within the organization as well. So we'll look at the artifact package model too. Why is this beneficial? End of the day is that it really reduces the mean time to resolution. So if you have some kind of a failure in the deployment, you know that this was the package that got deployed, and this is the package that caused an issue. So you can quickly track back in terms of exactly where the package was, what are the changes, what are the files that were included, and then track it back to the development and then start res resolving it. And again, push back a new, a new package so that it can fix it. For so it really reduces that time resolution as well. So quality control gates. So uh, here the main thing about gating strategy here is uh, so ensuring that you kind of work with the existing chain management systems. You know, it could be ServiceNow as an example here where you give them all the relevant information needed so you can quickly get it running in terms of, you know, rather than there's a lot of wait time involved many times when it comes to, you know, opening change orders and you know, things like that. So when you give them all the information needed, the approver is enabled and empowered to make the right decision in a very quick time, right? So that's essentially what that is talking about is ensuring that you go to you where your, where your users are. So if you have a change management system, go there, integrate with it, and then come back with the results of you know, how that looks. So it's ensuring that you have the right quality control gates at the right time. Next thing is about baselining metrics. Um, and it's very important. I mean, all the things we did so far, it's about ensuring that we always talked about continuous improvement, right? Um, how do you do that? Is by understanding where do you stand today, right? And that's essentially the whole goal. Here on this on the screen here on the left, just looking at the first thing is like a, a release manager's dashboard view of you, how, do you, how can you have the release cycle time, how can you improve productivity of a release, you know, you're tracking that metrics. Versus on the bottom, which is just looking at the release operation center view, which is looking at how your applications are getting deployed. So one is the release centric view, uh, really empowering the release managers, and the bottom you have more like, you know, really empowering the application owners of how the applications are getting deployed to a particular environment. So the benefit here, again, of course, is you can identify the opportunities. Like I said, there's so many things that we can all do, right, in terms of, you know, really start to build up automation within within the enterprise. But sometimes you just, this kind of, these views and these metrics help you understand what your best next opportunity lies in improving your properties. So that's essentially what it's all about, is about baselining your metrics and start doing, running analytic reports where you can find the next best opportunity to really improve uh, on your continuous delivery journey as well. Okay, so those are the five key steps, uh, essentially, um, in terms of, you know, uh, what it looks like, how you start adopting, and how you start quickly getting on the continuous delivery journey as well. Okay, so, so I'll give you a quick demo here, like a quick five-minute demo, just to kind of get you some of these things, like I said, it's, it's very visual in nature, so what we'll do is we'll touch on some of these key principles of how do you create model based deployment, you know, the zero touch deployment framework, the package model and so on and so forth, right? At the end of the day, what release automation does great is it's about the separation of the application workflow environment. So when you start building these models, they can be essentially deployed to QA test here with the same deployment workflow, the same package, and the test configuration. The configuration will differ as you go downstream, right? Here you may have uh, a pre-prod environment could have multiple different, you know, stacks that you may want to have. So the configuration will differ but your workflow would stay the same. Your package would stay the same. Similarly, when it gets to production, you want to defer to production, but then you would also have a disaster recovery setup that you may want to kind of keep in thing. How do you keep that? You know, you build the same flow. That's what I'll be kind of walking you through in terms of how do you build a model-based, you know, 
application workflow or release uh, automation workflow which can help you do that. So uh, let me switch here to the application. All right, cool. So now I'm hoping that you're seeing my desktop here. It's face sharing, so that's great. Perfect. So, so what are we looking at? So this is the CAV's automation dashboard. So I logged in as the administrator here, and essentially this kind of gives me uh, a real-time view of you know how my application is doing, how many of them are running, how many deployments have run. These are the analytical reports I was talking about. It gives you a metric of you know how many deployments have run, what are the failures like, and how how am I improving on my continuous delivery journey as well? You know, I had like these many deployments. I have increase the number of deployments and doing something better as I go downstream as well, right? So, things like that. The, the next thing is we'll start looking at the demo itself. The demo is essentially, I'll start showing you the deployment pipeline concept here. Uh, to begin with, one of, one, of the, one of the better pack success patterns I was talking about, right? So in this demo here, what we talk, we're looking at is we have the online financial training platform. It's inclusive that that whole platform includes multiple different applications uh, within it. One of them is mobile platform. So what we'll do is as a development team, a day in the life development team, they go in, they make some changes, and then eventually once they're ready, they would trigger a build. It could be automated, but for now we're just triggering that build. So the build that we're looking at is 323, and it's gonna be just start to build 324 in just a minute. When you look at the deployment pipeline, you see that 323 build was the last one that was deployed. It was deployed from development to stage and then production at a build 322. So that kind of gives you a good visual of you know how your application where it lies. We since we triggered this build from Jenkins, we include plugins that can automatically deploy the build to a particular environment. So in this case, on a successful build, uh, I've got deployed to development. We can go in and drill down and look at the details of that. Once you go in, it's essentially at this point building the artifact package. I think the artifact package that we have for this build, which is P24, includes these files. Like, you know, from web config, it's from the old P23 build. There's a new update to update DB SQL file, and so on and so forth. Right? So basically, essentially creating that artifact package. So this is the model I was talking about where you're tracking all the different changes that you have within your solution uh, in terms of tracking it. The next thing what we see here is the deployment plan. This is essentially a strategy for deployment. We're saying that in my, in my deployment plan for mobile app, it got my pre-configuration and showing my target you know, is, is ready, my environment is ready, and showing what my database applications are in a, in a sequential or parallel manner. So I can essentially go and drill down and say that my, for my database server, which is this particular server, 552, these are the artifacts that need to be essentially applied or in executed on that server, not like if you have an ex executable file, for example, you don't want to be running on a database server. This is a SQL file, it needs to be on the server, that needs to be run. And here's my database info, so it's also tracking the, the database info and the environment based on the type of your environment. So that's essentially what it is. It ensures governance as well and security in terms of you know, how you're um, kind of deploying that to that environment. So it just ran that, it basically went through post deployment as well. It completed the validation of that deployment and then basically automatically promoted it. So that was kind of touching on some of these key aspects I was talking about in terms of the pattern, which is auto deploy, which was the auto deploy from Jenkins into the development platform. Now it's automatically promoting, right? So it's now automatically promoting to multiple different environments from to test one and test two servers that both they can deployment deployed in parallel on, on different set of environments. We can go either of them. Uh, let's just pick one. Let's go test two, and we can just drill down again and start looking at you know what that looks like. The same package has been used, D24. It's keeping track of that, you know, which is the build, exactly the same package. Uh, it's also distributing it to the right server, right? Essentially, this this part of you know ensuring to the right agent to the right server. So what it does is it makes sure that the right servers are involved. Um, like going back to that example of ours, database server, it knew that this server requires the script to be on that server. So it knew that this is a server 552 for database. So it automatically distributes the artifact to the right server at the right time. So it's about ensuring the timing is correct. And then eventually it 
follow the right sequence of actions. If you notice the dependencies here, there's a dependency to ensure that your environments are ready before it kind of moves forward and does the deployment. And eventually, once your app server and database servers are up and done, then it basically starts running the web server configurations as well. So the orchestration is also important. Like I said, the automation is important, but the orchestration is also equally important. The 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 sequential activities, the parallel activities, you know, showing the right teams are involved. It's all part of the process. Okay. So we're going back to the pipeline. We continue to get that visibility. We now see that it's basically in staging at this point, and uh, eventually it'll basically follow the same steps. Um, I would not be kind of waiting here to come. Walk you through that here, but at the same time, you get, I think you get the idea in terms of the the deployment phases here. It's kind of going through the phases, and just because your environment is different, your your processes still they stay the same. So that gets me to the next step here, which is okay. So we just deployed it to multiple environments. Let's look under the hood and start looking at how do we start building these processes. Right? So. Here's where the models come into play. Uh, what I've done is I've kind of created these kind of templates or models, I like to call them, where the one that you're looking at, which is in play, which is the back office platform. So it's like, you know, I had something for database deployment, I had something for the full deployment, which is the strategy for, for me we are saying that I need to have these steps, that eventually once you have these steps, you start building the processes or the flows for these steps as well. So you could look at that on the side here. You create the flow, here's a database deployment, right? So that's the process that's tied to the steps that you have. You could very well add or remove any of these steps once you have the processes. So if you have, let's say, here's your JBoss application, you may have some other application. You could quickly, instead of using this, you could just create one of your own and simply use the same step. So that's what the whole reusability aspect is in terms of using the same exact step for your own deployment plan as well. So lastly, I think we have 10 minutes to go, so let me quickly go and just give a quick glimpse of the process design. Uh, we could very well have uh, a call, I guess, webinar, just to kind of dive deeper, but for now, just to give you an idea of what that process looks like, I'll just pick one here, which is database deployment, which shows the one that we're tracking for deployment so far. Um, here's the flow, that's how it looks like. It's pretty easy, like we're checking the, the space on that server before we run any kind of script, and then eventually we get a SQL query, and then we eventually run that SQL query as well. Right, so that's how it's ensuring that the right SQL file is being run with the right set of environment variables or the parameters specific to that environment. Okay, so, so back to the deployment pipeline overview. So essentially what you saw was the, how we're using the series automation as a backbone for taking a set of artifacts, you know, a set of, set of packages or the build packages and then deploying the development, and then auto-promoting it all the way to the pipeline to stage on, right? So that's what a quick demo was essentially just to kind of give you some idea of, you know, some of the success patterns. We'll be, we'll be happy to kind of walk you through it in terms of in more detail if you'd like to as well. So let's switch back to summarize, and then we can do quickly open up for questions too in just a minute. So in summary, uh, what we saw was, you know, your, your solutions when you want to really take control of your deployments initially, that's essentially the first step. That's why if you have those, you know, manual steps and, you know, manual processes, how do you make sure that you are fully in control of your environment and the deployment as well? So you be ensuring that you won't have ease of use and adoption is one of the key criteria, ease of support and maintenance, uh, you know, really at a scaled uh, enterprise level, not just for one application, so multiple applications, multiple dependencies. How do you have ease and support um, built in to the, the way you can manage your deployments? Make it modular, repeatable, reusable. That's, that's one of the key things. We talked about atomic, costly. How do you make it that such that you can build it once and use it across the organization for multiple applications? And then, of course, promote collaboration, right? It's kind of baking in the change management process, the input security process, the audit control. All of that is part of your initial deployment process. And your baseline metrics, identify opportunities. With the end goal being that you eventually want to have, let's say, a continuous delivery of service rolled out within the organization. Okay. So, so that's essentially I will, um, that what I want to cover here. Um, and we're just going to end with that. And then I think we can also start taking questions. So, if you don't mind, maybe if you can open up for any questions as well at this point. 
Sure. So just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, you can either enter them into the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to ask a verbal question, you can click pound six on your telephone keypad to unmute yourself. I'll give it just a minute in case anyone has any questions. And just a reminder, if you come up with any questions after the session, you can feel free to reach out to any of us, but we'll be happy to answer your questions. Or you can always enter them into the ARIA community. We have a, a team of people that monitors that space. Excellent. So while you're waiting on the question, so I just kind of like to can also talk about like this wrap up here in terms of, you know, continuous delivery, we all understand it's a journey. And I think we'll be happy to partner with you on that. We've been partnered with a lot of customers, really help them like, you know, increase their release cycle agility um, in terms of being adaptive to their existing on organization process, ensuring that they have the end-to-end -end orchestration in place. Um, and of course the automation, which could be thousands of composite releases, you know, across a very diverse set of complex environments. And then, of course, at the end of the day, it's about continuous optimization, right? It's about ensuring that your release quality and you're able to, you know, meet speed with quality and precision at, at all levels. You know, if you reduce errors, that's one aspect of it. But, of course, aside from that, it's ensuring that you can deliver any applications or any environment anytime. So that's, that's the key in terms of getting to that end goal and, and the end state of continuous delivery. And of course, any feedback, uh, let me know. And any ideas you have, I'd be happy to kind of learn from you as well in terms of you know, any ideas you have in terms of what's helping you in your journey as well. It'd be great. Okay, well, if there are no questions today, um, I'm gonna go ahead and close the session out. Um, I've posted a poll that should pop up on the right-hand side of your screen. If you could please let us know what you thought of today's webcast topic. We really value your feedback when we start planning future topics. So always like to see how you guys feel about that. Um, we also have a few more release automation sessions coming up this month, or for February, rather. We have one session on configuring high availability for release automation, and another one is on the RA integration with Team Foundation server. So if you're interested in those events, you can head to the RA community and RSVP to those. Um, other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, Anand, for the presentation today. We'll be posting the recording and the slides to the community later today, so keep an eye out for that. And just thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.